Hello and welcome to the penultimate episode of the series. Today, the search continues for the remains of Suzanne Pilly, who was murdered in 2010. We have caught Suzanne's killer, David Gilroy. However, David refuses to accept that guilt or assist us in any way to find Suzanne's body. Could you help her family finally put her to rest? Stay with us for Crime Watch Live. She's been jamming the switchboard both here and at the incident room on that case of running guard. Just to remind you, this was the abduction and radio drop campaign and the handgun debate. Hello and welcome to Crime Watch 12. People ranging, giving the same as fantastic results. Good morning and thanks for joining us. We had a huge response to the film we ran yesterday about that horrific collision where a dangerous driver three times over the limit and on his phone ploughed into a car and killed a seven month old and his aunt. We will pass all those messages on. So thank you for everyone that's got in touch. And we still have plenty in store today, including the peculiar case of a con artist preying on a pensioner by using her beliefs to steal thousands. And we'll be digging into the detail of rural crime. When this type of crime happens, everybody is determined to catch these type of offenders and put the offenders behind bars. Hey, our team are waiting backstage to take your calls along with some of the officers from today's programme. So if you have any information about the appeals we feature or have done over the last three weeks, then please do get in touch. It's easy to do. You can scan the QR code below using your phone's camera. That will take you through to our homepage. Otherwise, you can call us, and that's the number there, 0800 468 999. You can text us on 63399, text crime, leave a space, then write your message, or just send us an email if you prefer. That's the address there, cwl at bbc.co.uk. Now, first responders are trained to deal with all sorts of situations, having to make quick decisions that really can make the difference between life and death, which is exactly what Thames Valley Police did in this remarkable story. Valley Police, what's the emergency? A mobile home is just blown up. Someone needs to get here quick. Inside the ambulance, please. Move fast! Oh, my God. My name is James Gruhi. I'm currently Sergeant at Loddon Valley. My name is Peter John Leonard Screen. I'm a police officer. We respond to any of the 999 phone calls that come in that need an immediate police attendance. You haven't got a clue what's going to happen. You don't know what you're going to be faced with. T5 copy. This incident came in on um, our New Year's Day shift about 3.30 in the morning. Got reports of a caravan on fire and it's currently exploding. It's definitely on fire. We knew something quite major was happening and, and we knew we'd all have to pitch in and do what we could. Left, left where that car's where just that? come out. And this is something that could go terribly wrong very, very quickly. Am I going to go home tonight? Whilst we were travelling there, we were getting very limited information over the radio. T5 copy. Probably about a mile or two away, we could start to see the sky turning a haze of orange. And I think that gave us sort of a clue of the, the magnitude of what we're about to face. We were going to be the first emergency services there. So we were going to have to deal with what we could in front of us and try and keep people as safe as possible. Fire's here, Alex, fire's The one here. thing I was really had in the back of my mind at the time is someone might not be going home from this. Someone could be seriously injured or, or even killed. Move back! Move back! Everyone's there just staring at the fire, Move almost back. mesmerized by it and not really appreciating. They're incredibly close. Yeah, we can't come any closer, guys. There's still canisters and there's a fire there. We tried to discuss how far we would need to get people back from the explosion, how many caravans we were likely to have to evacuate around them and appropriate evacuation techniques. Ladies and gents, move back! 
I remember hearing over the radio that there was an elderly couple unaccounted for. They thought that they might be in one of the caravans that backed directly onto where the fire was happening. Two old people live in this we go over, start basically hammering on the door, trying to raise someone, try and get them out. This was only 40 foot from the actual caravan that was on fire. I knew that a couple of our colleagues had arrived a few minutes beforehand and they had found a casualty just outside where the fire was happening. When I saw the, the casualty on the floor was this is not good. He was really badly injured and quite severely burnt all over his body. I, I knew it was going to be really touch and go for him. We need to get him out of here as, as soon as possible. Everyone was pitching in, doing what they could to, to give first aid. Fire was spreading. At this point, one caravan was completely alight and almost unrecognisable. At that point, we were now all effectively cut off from the ambulances. Can the ambulance not get past then at all? OK. Someone managed to grab board from somewhere. We fashioned a makeshift stretcher. Everybody got it? Yep. So we just tied him to the board, and it was whilst we were doing that. Fireball spanned a good 50 to 100 metres into the air. Get back! It, it knocked me off my feet. The sound of the explosion, I, I remember that being deafening. The shockwave felt like a flash of heat going up from one side of my body to another this flash of white light and everything just pretty much turned to daylight in front of me. Get him out, get him out. We need to get out of here now. Go! Go! Don't run, don't run. Colleagues that were looking for the elderly couple, a large chunk of caravan metal flew straight towards them. There was a wheel, if there was a bike that came with it, I have no idea. Just raining down upon us, and I'm just there trying to shield myself as best as I can, but also running towards a point of safety. Are you OK, guys? Are you OK? Yeah. Well, that was pretty close. Right, let's go back. <laughs> so then go back, get into the caravan. No one's there, thankfully. Hey, we still had lots of residents out in front of us. Keep moving! Move back! We just needed to get everyone out of there. Guys, everyone get out! Wait, need the car, need the car! Just keep walking up for us. We weren't going to leave anyone behind. Everyone out! Out on foot, please! I knew that we had to get back to the ambulance. We knew it was going to be a, a long slog of getting the casualty and the stretcher all the way around the entire perimeter of the site to get back. Everybody out! <laughs> It was a real sense of relief just seeing it there and just handing him over. Got all of our colleagues together. Looked at each other and just went, right, back we go. The casualty went to hospital and he managed to, to pull through. And I think he was in hospital for a long time, but he, he made a recovery. Everyone played a really key part of keeping everyone safe. Thankfully, nobody lost their lives that night. The fire was huge. I mean, you're talking 40 foot of just roaring inferno, a sight that was ingrained into my mind, and I'll never ever be able to forget it. If it happened again, without a doubt, I'd run straight towards it and make sure I did the best thing possible. We just attended the National Police Bravery Awards. I don't think any of us thought that we'd get recognised for anything like that. We were just doing what 
we thought we needed to do uh, to keep people safe and, and basically just doing our jobs. To see so many of my young in service colleagues acting so heroically and without a second thought for, for anything made me in incredibly proud of all of them. I don't think anyone on our team had dealt with something of that scale. It still amazes me that no one was killed. Such bravery from those officers there. The explosion must have been absolutely terrifying. Now, those two elderly residents the officers were looking for were safe and well. Later on, we're talking to Christian O'Reilly, an advocate for the power of prison, as he used his time inside to develop his skill set and swap crime for a camera. But before that, on the 4th of May 2010, Suzanne Pilly was reported missing by her family. Police Scotland launched an investigation. And in 2012, David Gilroy was convicted of her murder. But he has never disclosed where Suzanne's body may be. In 2010, 34-year-old bookkeeper Suzanne Pilly was murdered by her colleague and former lover, David Gilroy. Suzanne's body has never been found. DCI Bob Williamson, who worked on the case at the time, is not giving up the search. It was very unusual to solve a murder without a body. We have caught Suzanne's killer, David Gilroy. However, David refuses to accept that guilt or assist us in any way to find Suzanne's body. The movement of David Gilroy over the 4th and 5th of May 2010 can be boiled down to a, a series of events where he's attempted to maintain a normal life, fully in the knowledge that he has murdered Suzanne and is making plans on how to, to hide her body. After he's killed her, he has then advised another colleague that he needed to return home. He's collected his car and brought it back into Thistle Street Lane. At some stage during that, he's then moved Suzanne from below the fire escape area and placed her within the booty's vehicle. He's finished his work, driven the car home, and met his wife and family for a function at the school. He's then attended a local restaurant in Edinburgh and then returned home. Having made alterations to his calendar, he's then attended a meeting at Loch Gilped Community School, which was a surprise. And he then canceled a person that was supposed to be coming with him for that meeting, which was also unexpected. He has had time to make that plan, given that he had killed Suzanne in the morning of the 4th and didn't leave for his journey until the late morning of the 5th of May. His actions after a murder are certainly cold and calculated. He's taken extensive steps to hide Suzanne and prevent her ever being found. Police were able to track Gilroy to our gal through CCTV and phone data, which exposed red flags with his story. The first was the route that he took. He would normally come up the west side of Loch Lomond, across the rest and be thankful, and then down to Loch Gilped. We know this because he had taken that journey a number of times with another individual from his work. But on the 5th of May, Gilroy chose to take a completely different route that led him up to Tindrum, past the Green Welly stop, round to Inverary, and down to Loch Gilped. That should only take about 40 minutes. However, on the way to Loch Gilped, it took David one hour 33, and on the way back, an hour and 50 minutes which clearly brings in a bit of a question as to what was happening. Now, that area from Tindrum to Inverary is a very remote road. There's forest tracks that are accessible to vehicles, but would certainly be a suspicious situation if a vehicle such as a Vauxhall Vectra was driving along. There's lots of opportunities along those routes for them to have driven off-road with the purpose of hiding Suzanne. The search for Suzanne's body has never stopped. The area that we're looking at can be described as a mixture of rural countryside, highland areas, and planned forests. It's a massive, massive search area. 
the potential of where he could go, particularly if he's got knowledge of the area. And we believe that David was interested in wild camping, so we'd know a lot of these routes that were maybe off the normal walking routes that people would take. So when we factor that in an hour and a half on the way up and an hour and 50 minutes on the way back down, it's considerable time to be able to, to find a suitable spot for hiding someone. The underside of the vehicle, when it was forensically examined, revealed scuff marks on the, the base and some damage to the, the spring coils, which suggested that it had maybe been driven off-road. Until Suzanne Pilly's body is found, her case remains open. Police Scotland have maintained contact with Suzanne's family throughout. Rob, her father, has since sadly passed away, not ever having got the answers that we've been trying to get him and bring Suzanne home. The fact that we couldn't get Suzanne back in time is still a painful thing for us. We still reassure Suzanne's family constantly that we'll do anything we can to find Suzanne and that any information that comes to us, we'll make sure that we follow up on and we'll always keep them involved. David's lack of cooperation is very frustrating and I think the honourable thing to do is to bring some closure to Suzanne's family and bring her home. It means so much to the family and everyone involved in the investigation if they could do just that, bring Suzanne home. Earlier this week, I spoke to DCI Bob Williamson from Police Scotland and I started by asking him why they're continuing their appeal. It's very unusual to have no body murders and uh, particularly when someone's convicted for that crime, you would hope that they would assist you in finding the remains of the family's loved one, in this case, Suzanne. However, David's not assisted, so again, we're back asking the public if they can help us think back to that day and if there's any chance that they could remember from back in May 2010 as to whether they saw anything unusual in the area of that that we've talked about in the show and a person walking about that just didn't seem to fit into the area or even that silver Vauxhall Vectra driving in on a, on a road that it shouldn't be on. Well, can you just remind us of where police believe Suzanne may have been taken? Sure. So we believe that the, the route that David took was up past the rest and be thankful. Um, and during that journey, he took a number of uh, potential routes uh, switching his phone off, which gave him access to a number of roads that uh, we just don't know at this time, the, the exact route that he would have taken. But it was certainly up in the Argyle Forest area and the rest to be thankful, certainly around that area, all the way down to Loch Gilped uh, via Inverary. Now, this was a long time ago, but there was some distinctive markings on the vehicle that you really need to for people to think back in case it jogs their memory, because that could be crucial to this investigation. That's correct, yeah. But it was a silver Vauxhall Vectra, and we believe it had some, although they wouldn't have been obvious to the public, it, when we examined the vehicle, it had some scuff marks on, on the underside, some damage, minor damage to the underside of the vehicle that suggested it may have been driven off-road. Um, people that know the area will know there's a number of forestry tracks, some of which are secure, some of which can be accessed and which can uh, certainly take a vehicle, however, would cause damage due to the uneven terrain that the vehicle would be driving over. So if, you certainly wouldn't expect to see a, a silver Vauxhall Vectra vehicle driving down one of those roads. Um, and uh, if, if, that's, if you did see that and it jumped out to you that day, then we need to know where that was um, to allow us to centre a search on particular areas where Suzanne might be. There was also the possibility that there was a, a red and white umbrella, golf umbrella, on the back parcel shelf, which may have been obvious to someone uh, on the outside of the vehicle. That could also provide a clue as to it being the vehicle that we're interested in. Yeah, really important information there. Now, I know you and your team, you've worked with Suzanne's family for many years on this case, and you know how much this would mean to them just to get some answers on, on where she could be. That's correct. It's Unfortunately, Suzanne's dad didn't survive long enough for her to be found. And it's something that's been really important to Police Scotland is to recover Suzanne. Since 2010, we've been trying that and repeated appeals, uh, just hoping that a member of the public will just think, well, maybe that bit of information I've got is important and let's bring Suzanne back to the family. They've been so strong for all this time 
and put up with so much grief for the past uh, 20, uh, 14 years, sorry, which has obviously caused a lot of stress for the family. And to be able to bring Suzanne home and allow them to give her a proper funeral would be a massive, massive thing for them. Yeah, it would indeed. Unimaginable stress on the family. Bob, thank you for joining us. If you recall seeing anything at all, remember the date was the 5th of May, it was 2010 in the Argyle Forest area. Or if you've become aware of anything in the years since, please do get in touch. Suzanne deserves to be reunited with her family after all this time. The number to call is 08000 468 and remember it is free from landlines and mobile phones. Our lines are open from 9am until midday and you can also text us 24 hours a day. That number is 63399, just text the word crime, then leave a space, then write your message. Text will be charged at your standard message rate. Or of course you can always send us an email. The address is cwl at bbc.co.uk. You may have seen in the news today a story about blessing scammers who are targeting Chinese communities, tricking older women out of valuables and cash by persuading them that their loved ones are in danger. Well, we're with Gwent Police now, who've got an appeal about exactly this. I'm joined by police staff investigator Jay Clark to tell us more. Thanks so much for being with us this morning, Jay. This is quite an unusual investigation, isn't it? Tell us more about the case you're covering. Yes, in this particular case on the 15th of May 2024, um, a female was out doing their shopping in Newport city centre when she was approached by a woman um, on Commercial Street. The woman said to the victim that she needed some help with her husband who was ill, whereby another woman then came out and said that she knew of a person that could help, a spiritual healer of some sort. Mm. The trio then walked um, to the area around Newport city footbridge. Uh, whereby a third woman came out and told the victim that she was unable to go and see the spiritual healer because she had lots of bad spirits uh, around her. The reason why she had the bad spirits, they said, was because you know her family were in imminent danger, um, but that could be resolved if she went home, which were all her cash savings and jewellery, and had it cleansed. One of the suspects then travelled back with the victim. In the meantime, the two other suspects were buying things like flour and newspaper in order to exchange and the money in question. Um, they all came back to the exchange point whereby one of the suspects led the victim to Newport City Footbridge to say a ritual of some sort. Mm. Um, while that was going on, the suspects were exchanging the 200,000 pounds of cash and goods for bags of flour. Oh my gosh, I mean, Jay, this is such a manipulative, mm. calculated scam to just draw money out of the victim. Mm. That's awful. Yeah, in this particular circumstance, they've preyed on her vulnerabilities and her mm. spiritual beliefs, and she's unfortunately not a significant amount of money. Um, Let's talk about these suspects then, because we've got some CCTV footage that we can show of one of them. What can we see here? So this woman is a Chinese woman. She's going into a local uh, shop in Newport, and she's buying here the, the flour, um, which will later be used to replace the cash. I see. The bags. We've got a freeze frame image of, of the suspect here. How would you describe her? Uh, she's a Chinese female, uh, can speak Cantonese, it's believed. Uh, she's got black shortish hair and she's of average build. OK, and we've got an image of the second suspect. How would you describe this female? Again, of Chinese descent, uh, believed to speak Cantonese. Uh, she's got shorter black hair, she's slightly thinner um, and slightly taller as well than the first suspect. And as you said, there is a third suspect, but we, we haven't got an image of, of that. We've got the, the first two. Yes, that's correct, yes. And you would urge anybody to come forward that, that's got any information? Absolutely. Uh, hopefully, if we manage to locate or find one of these uh, women, mm. then we could locate the third suspect as well. Absolutely, Jay. Thanks so much for coming in and telling us more about this scam. So do you recognise these women? If you do have any information, remember, no matter how small, please pick up the phone. Now, rural crime is a growing problem, costing the country over an estimated £50 million in the last year alone. It's becoming high-tech, involving drones and sophisticated methods, but there is one team using traditional equipment to combat it. The Hertfordshire Constabulary Rural Support Team are using tractors like these, and even have some mini ones like these in tow. And it's all to build bridges with the local communities. And Sergeant Alex Winning from Hertfordshire Constabulary Rural Operational Support Team is here to tell us more. Morning, Alex. So Morning. your unit is, is really all about 
this sort of rural crime. Tell us more. Yeah, exactly. So my, I head the unit for the Rural Operations Support Team in Hertfordshire, uh, and we focus on rural crime, wildlife crime, fields, farms, badgers, bats, you name <laughs> it, it falls under our remit. Um, and we will focus on rural crime trends that are set by the National Rural Crime Unit and the rural crime strategy that's set by Half Chicken Stabbery. And some of what you deal with is, is kind of seasonal, but some of it is all year round, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, hugely. So some of the crime types that are focused on by our team, like hair coursing, for example, that's very seasonal, dependent on when crop is in the ground. Again, agricultural machinery theft, uh, tractor theft, GPS theft from tractors, that's all quite seasonal, dependent upon when those bits of equipment are being used in the fields. Mm -hmm. So we'll focus on those at certain times of the year, but then we have other times of the year when we'll focus on things like fly tipping, for example. It's a year-round plight that farmers have to face, and we will deal with uh, fly tipping offences and do proactive work to combat fly tipping. And a big part of the team's role is, is to raise awareness and change people's perceptions around rural crime, isn't it? Why is yeah, that so important? Say. I think there's been some misconceptions in years gone by around rural crime and whether it's worth reporting it and whether the rural communities will get the same support from the police as people in the town, let's say. Mm. And my unit's role, or part of my unit's role, is to try and change those perceptions and get people engaged with it, get people reporting. Things like big tractors at county shows is just one way we're doing that. Yeah. Um, the amount of times I I've been asked why do the police have a tractor at a county show <laughs> and I have to tell them that it's not for chasing people across fields, it's to start conversations around rural crime and rural crime strategies. And what is the reaction like then when you take these, it's, you it's, know, these pieces been, of kit to the shows? It's really, really positive. We get the parents coming to speak to us about the big tractor and why do we have the tractor and engaging with us about rural crime and then we have the kids who just want to have a go on the little tractors and be a police officer for a few minutes. Well, yeah, the kids, we also see some big kids. You just saw one of the <laughs> yeah. police officers riding there having a great time. Yeah, but it's, I mean, it's all about breaking down those barriers. Exactly. 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 Uh, we're, we're people at the end of the day, but police yes. officers, people see them in uniform and there's almost a bit of a disconnect and breaking down those barriers, even if it's as silly as putting a police officer on a tractor for two minutes, the public can see it. Yeah. You just break down those barriers, yeah. start those com that bit of Because on a, on a serious note, a, a lot of these crimes are, in, in your experience, underreported, aren't Usually. they? Why, why do you think that is? I, th I think it's just a case of people not necessarily think it's worth reporting it. They might not have had the response that they had in the past or they might not have had a bad experience in the past. So I've tried to make it as easy as I can to get people to report and encourage reporting through NFU meetings and community engagement events and setting up new ways of reporting through Harp Chicken Stabbery. And how do they do that? So you've got the traditional methods, 999 if it's a, a crime in progress, if it's happening right now we'll respond out to it, 101 if it's just happened, but if it, people want to take a little bit more time and do it at their leisure, there's two new online portals on our website, one specifically for rural crime, one specifically for wildlife crime, little drop downs and it makes it much easier to report and comes directly to a unit like mine that has the specialism to deal with it. So good for people to be aware of that and it's easy to do isn't it? It makes it so much easier and, and hopefully we'll build that trust between us and the public. Police, if you don't know what's going on, you can't act on it. No, yeah. it, all, all that information comes into me and helps me map where I'm going to put my units, where I'm going to plan my operations, and where in the county I need to focus on at certain times of the year. Without people reporting, I can't, I can't fully do that. Oh, Alex, well. thanks so much for coming in and bringing your big no, you're and, welcome. and small tractors. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me. Thanks, Alex. Well, to hear more about what is clearly a growing problem, we join the National Rural Crime Unit in action. We were dealing with an organised criminal gang. I think it's the, the biggest haul ever. When this type of crime happens, everybody is determined to catch these type of offenders and put the offenders behind bars. Hey, Across Britain, there's a new crime wave hitting the countryside. Thieves are sneaking onto farms and stealing state-of-the-art GPS equipment. And farmers, like Bobby Barnes, are suffering. We had five GPS receivers and three GPS screens stolen in the night. We have some CCTV footage of them walking in across the field. We've got no idea who they were. They, they were masked, with hats on, and they went in and out. The GPS devices, which can cost more than £10,000 each, have become an essential tool for many farmers.
we're applying products, chemicals, seeds with it, and it all gets put on a lot more accurately and saves us, along with our customers, lots of money. In 2022, thieves stole almost £2 million worth of GPS devices from UK farmers, and the latest figures suggest the problem is getting worse. We spent a lot of money to buy it. If anyone hasn't got them insured, it costs a lot to replace. And without it, it just makes everything a lot harder. Thankfully, there's a dedicated network of police officers working to put a dent in this lucrative criminal enterprise. The National Rural Crime Unit, they're specifically tasked with targeting offences which occurs on farms and farmland. It's been recognised it's become a national problem and that team's job is to specifically target those offenders. In 2023, the team worked on a challenging case involving the theft of GPS devices after some intelligence was passed to them from North Yorkshire Police. These offences have been going on uh, nationally for a number of months, but we had no leads on, on the case. Uh, no offenders had been identified. The only thing we knew is that there was a Vauxhall Antara had been linked to some offences in North Yorkshire. At the end of April last year, that vehicle activated AMPR cameras in the Humberside area. Officers were quickly deployed and um, got behind that vehicle. They've then found the vehicle on Holdenness Road in Hull, and then the vehicle pulled into a, a car park. All right. All right. The, the male tried to make off from officers on foot. Cops everywhere, stop! It, in the end, he, he, he was caught and he gave up. The man was a Lithuanian national called Tomas Stakauskas. We searched his vehicle, and within that vehicle was 17 GPS devices and screens. Nearly all of these was wrapped within tin foil. Once they become unplugged, they, they no longer pass out a signal. This is obviously unknown to Stakauskas and he thinks by wrapping them in tin foilies makes them undetectable. The value of the haul was estimated to be around £170,000. Thomas Dukauskas was arrested on suspicion of theft and taken to the police station, while officers investigated where the GPS units had been taken from. Some of them had serial numbers and it was found they'd been stolen nationally from a fire field in Scotland and down south in uh, Devon and Cornwall. At this point, the uh, National Rural Crime Team became involved. The vehicle Stokowskis was driving was registered to a false address in Hull. The officers did some further checks and they went to a previous address of Stokowskis. The person they found at the address was a man called Mantus Palionis. And on doing further checks, there was a, a van outside which was on false plates. This van was then discovered to have also been stolen. Within the van was a number of false number plates and a GPS signal blocking device. There was also bank cards within there in the name of Mantas Polianis, which, which further linked him to the van. And within the address, he also had the keys to the stolen van. With overwhelming evidence against him, police arrested Palionis. Detectives were now convinced they were dealing with an organised criminal gang. Neither of them gave us any account whatsoever as to how they became in possession of these devices. To get some answers, detectives looked into the movements of Stokowskis' car. ANPR and CCTV footage tracked it to a compound in Hedden, just outside Hull. And there, a container was discovered, which the Kauskas had access to. Later on, we recovered a key fob from Stokowski's property, which gave access to that compound. 49 devices were found in the container, valued at around £300,000. It's the, the biggest haul ever. 
In November 2023, Tomas Dakauskas and Mantas Palionis pleaded guilty to offences of handling stolen goods. Stakauskas was sentenced to four years in prison and Palionis was sentenced to three years. I was over the moon. It has been massive for the National Rural Crime Unit. I'm really glad the police have done a good job and brought these thieves to justice. Looking forward to getting our GPSs back and getting them on machines working like they should be. If you are a criminal or a gang and you're operating in a rural area, it don't go on notice and eventually you will be arrested and you will be imprisoned. Cracking work from the National Rural Crime Unit, catching criminals and gaining convictions. And for some people, prison can be a chance to change the course of their lives, which is exactly what our next guest did. I'm joined now by Christian O'Reilly. Christian, thanks so much for, for joining us this morning. I mean, you have had an incredible career today in photography, but it'd be lovely to go back to the beginning of your story, really, and, and find out how you ended up in prison. I went to prison for conspiracy of importation for 413 kilograms of cannabis resin. Um, I actually remember the first day I got locked up, which was a quite a scary moment. A lot of mixed emotions, but mainly um, relief. I felt relief. Really? I was, yeah, I was happy that it was like a reset. It was like, it was like the start of my new life and I mm. needed it to happen. So I was quite relieved. So how long were you in, in prison for? Um, I had a four year sentence, um, served in Cardiff prison and Park prison. And whilst you were there, I guess you, you started on this new journey, didn't mm -hmm. you? You took the opportunity to, to change paths, to change direction. Yeah, well, I mean, like I said, when the door locked, it was like a reset button. I, I started and I knew I needed to make good of a bad situation. So I started reading, I started, I learned a new language. I, I, I read books from cover to cover and I really hyper-focused on those subjects that I was reading and mainly photography. Had you always had an interest in photography then? Yeah, like, where I mean, did that come from? It stems back to um, a young age, a core memory of mine with, with my dad developing images in, uh, in the attic in my house um, ba Aww. back in the day. Um, yeah, so it's always been like a hobby of us for the family, but my dad yes. was a hobbyist. But, and then when, obviously when I took it professionally, I made a career out of it and, uh, and went from there. And it's gone from there. So, so you had this interest in prison, which was born into a passion and then into this successful career that you've been doing ever since. Did you ever think, you know, looking at yourself now that, that this would happen? No, I guess it could have been any subject. I just really needed to focus in on something and put all my energy into that subject. Yeah. And um, my dad used to send me, uh, you know, books, uh, the art of photography, and I used to read in prison. And I kind of like tried to dissect images and try to figure out why an image spoke to me or mm. more importantly, why an image didn't speak to me and how I could make those images, um, you know, f to connect with other people. What was the first ever photo you took when you came out? Um, probably not my first ever photo, but what, most memorable would be my daughter and my sister's wedding, actually, is which I began my, my wedding oh photography my career. Christian, that's beautiful. <laughs> Stunning. And we've got some other photos of, of your work here, which are just, they're, they're incredible. Like, just so engaging. They, they draw you. I mean, what's your, what's your technique? Because it's quite unique. Yeah, I mean, and weddings are live events, so it most thing, mostly is candid, but I tried to bring an approach from a more fine art photography perspective, which means essentially my, everything is under my control in the frame, composition, light, um, pose, focal length, camera, everything used is under my control. So that's more of a, like a fashion essence mm -hmm. to my photography, um, along with the candid. And I tell you what, you've been so busy. I mean, you said before you've been to what, 16 different countries Yeah, you're this very year. tired and the season's coming to an end now. We've done 16 countries and probably over hundred events this year. But it must be so incredibly rewarding, it just is. kind of reflecting on where you've come from and just even having a look through the pictures in your books. This is, this is amazing for you. Appreciate that, thank you so much. So for anyone watching that, that might have had a similar experience to you, might be you're in prison, what would, advice would you give them? What would you say to them? It's not, it's not the end, it's actually just the beginning to make good choices, make good decisions um, and try to surround yourself with the, with the right people. Try to get out of the rut you're in and, and success is, is there. You just have to go for it and put all your energy into the right things. What gave you that focus? What, was there like a switch moment for you where you thought, yeah, I'm, I'm moving on? Absolutely, I mean, my freedom 
freedom was taken away from me. So when I went in, when I went to prison, I was like, how do I make you know good of this situation? And you know, I, I stopped smoking, I started training my mind, body, and I just hyper focused on on a specific subject and just run with it. And then I made a career out of it. Mm. And you've done so well. So thank, thank you so much, you so much for, for coming in right. and telling us more about your career. All the best for the future thank as well. So I'm sure you so continue much. to be very successful. Thank Beautiful you, photos, Christian. Appreciate it. Thanks for your job. Thank you, yes. Rav. Absolutely, some incredible photos there. Time now for Wanted Faces. So first of all, we start with Jamie Edmonds, but he also uses the name Jay Cash. West Midlands Police have charged him with several offences and he has now been breached his bail conditions. He's 30 with a number of distinctive tattoos, including the words Jay and Different Day on his arms. He has links to the Sandwell and Birmingham areas of the West Midlands. Or perhaps you know this man, this is David Fannon, or perhaps you know him by the surname McDowell or Atkinson and the nickname Jeb or Jed. He's unlawfully at large after being recalled to prison. He's 58, has a northeast accent and a large number of tattoos on both arms, including a dagger, eagle, scroll, and the words mam and dad on his left hand. And lastly, for today anyway, can you help Thames Valley Police find Yu Yang? Though you may know her by the name Nikki Yang. She's been found guilty of causing injury by dangerous driving, but absconded before being sentenced. She has links to Warfield and Bracknell in Berkshire, and to London in particular, to the Canary Wharf, Isle of Dogs, Greenwich, Vauxhall, and Nine Elms areas. So if you recognise any of these people, please do get in touch. And we just wanted to bring you a quick update on an appeal we ran last Friday into a fatal hit and run in Hammersmith, London. On the 16th of January this year, mother of two, 58-year-old Ina Rodriguez, was crossing Talgoth Road close to Barons Court Station in London. A moped skipped a red light and drove straight into her. The two riders got back on the bike and they fled the scene, leaving Ina in the road. She was taken to hospital hall, but she sadly died five days later. Now, the moped had been stolen two weeks before on Fulham Palace Road. And as we can see from this footage, the two riders dumped the bike at 8.25 p.m. that night uh, around Edith Road, which was a short distance away from where the incident took place. Now, this is a bit of extra footage here where we can see the two suspects without their helmets on. It isn't the best quality, but we've slowed it down and we're going to put that on our website so you can have another look a bit more closely. So if you do recognise them or know anything about this awful case, there is a £20,000 reward from Crime Stoppers being offered. So please call them or you can call us. The numbers are on the screen. Thanks for watching. We have had some really interesting calls today, I should say, about the Susan Pilly appeal. So please do keep that information coming in. And I can also tell you, we've just heard that another of our wanted faces has been arrested, which is great news. We will bring you more details on that when we can, of course. If you would like any help on any issues raised throughout the programme, then please do contact BBC Action Line. Tomorrow, the mystery of the murder of Paul McGrath and his sister's heartfelt plea to finally find his killer. Paul's death has been absolutely overwhelming in every aspect of our lives. And that pain can only be reduced by us getting justice. And remember, if you've missed any of the programmes over the past three weeks, you can catch us on iPlayer for up to 30 days after broadcast. We'll see you tomorrow for the final episode of the series. That's at 9.30. See, see you then. Bye-bye.